Good morning, GCF South Metro. Uh, is it all right if I ask all of you to rise as we begin this morning's worship service? Um, you know, I've always appreciated how we start our worship service with prayer time, with praying for our sick uh, church members, for praying for our family members, uh, the events that we have in church, and even in um, praying for the Philippines, praying for our leaders here in church. Uh, because it really does go to show that when we worship here in church, especially you, it's not that we're forgetting all of our troubles. It's not that we're forgetting our circumstances, no? But worship is the bringing of those circumstances here. When you walk through those doors, we remember that we come from different circumstances. We come from different trials and pains and hurts over this week. And it's not that when we sing songs, we try and forget them, no. It's... When we sing these songs, we're saying, God, I have all these troubles and trials and hurts and pains, and I want to bring them before you. And I need to be reminded of unwavering truth. So church, I need you to sing loud today because the people standing beside you need to be reminded of God's truth coming from your mouth. I need you to sing loud today because you yourself, need to be reminded and you need to remind yourself of the truth that stands despite what uh, despite any circumstances we may be in right now and so this morning let's declare together that we serve a living God and we serve the God of ages and we receive his blessings together Come thou fountain. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet. Sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the name. Hitherto thy love has blessed me, thou hast brought me to this place, and I know thy hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, Interpose his precious And we remember as a church that we are debtors to grace and we come here together, join together because we are brothers and sisters under the blood of Christ. Let's sing, O oh, to Grace. O oh, to Grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to me. Grown to wander, Lord, I feel it. Grown to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy court above. You remember? That we await the day when Christ shall come again and we will be with Him forever and ever. Sing His praises as brothers and sisters join under His blood. Let's sing. Oh, that day when freed from sinning, I shall see Thy lovely face. Full of rain, but wash linen. I will sing thy song. Come, my Lord, no longer tarry. Come, my Lord, no longer tarry. Bring thy promises to pass. For I know thy power will keep me till I'm home with thee at last. Come, my Lord, no longer tarry. Bring thy I 
that we serve the God of ages? Do you believe that we serve a living God and this is the same God who from eternity past decided that He would show His glory, He would make His glory known by saving us? So let's declare this song together as one church, as one voice, that He truly is the God of ages. God of ages, bringing glory You are good, you are good, son of righteousness, you are all I see, with all my heart, giver of life, oh for the lost is in you. declare his promise and his faithfulness in your promise and your faithfulness I will trust all my days King Salvation to us, 
offer your peace to the world. You are my Lord, my every day. Let's declare that one more time. You are the God who lives. You are the God who heals. You are my hope, my every day. You brought salvation. Your peace to the world. You are my Lord, my everything. Amen and amen. Why don't we lift up a clap offering to our God? Father, we remember that you are the God of ages, and we we are astounded because the same God who created the heavens and the earth was the same one who chose to make his glory known not coming to earth as a conqueror but coming to earth as a servant as a lowly carpenter as as a young helpless baby and we remember that you grew up like a young plant with no beauty or form that we should look on you you were nothing particularly special, and yet you were the Messiah of this world. And we remember how you humbled yourself, you became a man of sorrows, and you were pierced for our transgressions. So church, as we sing this new song, we can take the next few moments to just reflect on the lyrics, listen to their lyrics, and reflect on them. You remember that the sins that Jesus died for, those were my sins, those were your sins. And he humbled himself so that we could be with him. Yeah. 
Let's sing hallelujah. Every 
Lift up your voices. Make this the prayer of your hearts. We must go. Stepping forward. Keep us from just singing. Father, truly, this is a day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you that our soul cries out, Hallelujah, Father. For you have been so good to us. Lord, we cannot be proud of anything, Father. But thank you that you're the God who has given us so much. You came, you died on the cross for our sins. And Father, it's the very reason, Lord, why we come together as individuals, as a church, as a brotherhood, to praise you, to thank you. We remember what the psalmist said, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Father, I pray that you would truly burden us, Father, with your love. The love for our fellow men, the love for our neighbors, the love for our country, the love for the world. You have died and you are sending us, Father, to bring the same message to the whole wide world. Allow us, Father, that same burden that you have had. Thank you for life. Thank you for health. Thank you for our families and our relationships. 
Thank you that each day we wake up with renewed strength. Thank you for the security you provide us wherever we go out of our homes, go to work, go to school. Father, you truly have blessed us with so much. And Lord, we pray that even as we come together as a family, that we will just lift our hearts and voices unto you. May we open our hearts, Father, even to the message this morning. May you bless our messenger, your messenger, Lord, that he may speak the words that you want us to listen to, the words that you want us to hear. And even as we step out of this auditorium, Father, may we bring this same message to wherever we are. We thank you for the past week. And we look forward, Lord, to another week of excitement, even as we bring this message, even as we become your mirrors, a reflection of your love to the whole wide world. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. This morning, as uh, perhaps was mentioned to you, perhaps uh, you, you look around and uh, you see many uh, men uh, not present here today. It's not true that they have been raptured. <laughs> They're at uh, CCT, at the Men's Crossroad Weekend, uh, happening until tomorrow. The Men's Crossroad Weekend is a wonderful opportunity for men to come together uh, from various uh, stages in life, various uh, uh, life situations. And it's, uh, I've, I've seen it uh, over the past couple of years, having attended the Men's Crossroad myself how um, men, some men come with very heavy hearts, very heavy burdens. And uh, they come, and when they listen to the interaction that takes place during the weekend, they're somehow refreshed, reminded about who God is from the stories that they learn from, from others uh, in their uh, groups. And so the encouragement of the leaders of GCF South Metro is that uh, you would be able to attend at least once every two years, whether a men's crossroad, a women's crossroad, or a couple's uh, crossroad. Uh, the women's crossroad happens around March or April, and the couple's crossroad happens uh, in November. This year, it will be on November 16 to 18. So if those of you who have not attended any of our crossroad weekends, we would you prayerfully consider uh, and save up for this blessed opportunity to come together and learn uh, together uh, how the Lord will uh, uh, reach you wherever uh, you are in your life uh, stage. So today we continue our sermon series uh, from the Gospel of Mark, our series entitled Servanthood and Sacrifice. And uh, our uh, message today is entitled Expectation of Fruitfulness, uh, taken from Math Mark 11, 27 until 12, uh, chapter 12, uh, verse 12. Let us all stand. May we request, I request you to stand as we honor uh, the reading of Scripture. From verse 27, And they came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, when did, Why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the winepress and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he said to, to another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. 
Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we commit our time to you this morning. We ask, Lord, we humbly ask that your Holy Spirit would uh, lead us and guide us to a clear understanding of your word this morning from the Gospel of Mark. I pray that you move in the hearts of my brothers and sisters, that uh, they may not just listen, they, that they may just not hear your word, but also apply it, especially this message, this call to fruitfulness. We pray this with great anticipation in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. So before we go to the um, exposition, the, the study of the word this morning, let us uh, just do a uh, review once again from the word and from last week's sermon that was uh, uh, given to us uh, in the morning last week by Elder Domi and uh, Pastor Lito in the afternoon. So we learned from the past sermon about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, riding on a lowly and timid donkey. Not a, uh, a big, you know, uh, and uh, fierce animal, perhaps that uh, is worthy of the stature of, of Jesus. But he came on a lowly donkey, as was uh, foretold in the Old Testament, in Zechariah 9.9, where it is written, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So this is Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. When he came on earth, he was born on a lowly manger. In this uh, particular scene, as he entered Jerusalem, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he came on a lowly donkey. You know, when you, when you visit when you go to a zoo, wherever part of the world you are, you want to go to see the majestic lion or the tiger, you know, or one of these huge animals, a rhinoceros perhaps, or a, or a hippo. But you don't see, you don't go to a zoo and say, I want to see the donkey. Diba? But this is a show of the kind of Lord, the kind of Messiah that Jesus is. From past sermons, we, we learned, we heard Pastor Lito often mention that perhaps the Jews were waiting for a, a mighty ruler, you know, a mighty king. And that is why they still, still do not know and have, still have not accepted that Jesus Christ is the Messiah promised by God. Today, this is a grim and yet timely reminder for those who continue to reject Jesus and the kind of example that we are called to follow. Because indeed, as Christians, when we uh, profess to be believers, to be followers of Jesus Christ, the call for us is Christ-likeness, to be like Christ. But you and I know that that's easier said than done. It's easy to say, oh, you know, in your particular situation, what would Jesus do? But of course, if someone hurts you, you know, with, with stinging words, or someone treats you unfairly, you, know, you want to react and uh, 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 react according to how the world dictates. And you, you want to hurt that person with equally, if not more, stinging words than what you received. But Jesus' example is that of 
humility. This humble servant was to be Messiah, was to be the, the, the God, uh, to be what God the Father had sent for the forgiveness of all sins. That is why we need Jesus, because he alone can forgive us of our sins. As surely and as humbly as Jesus entered Jerusalem, this is the call for us to humble ourselves before him, to set aside our pride and arrogance for us to, and in our continued refusal to accept this humble king. And instead, you know, we can continue life as if we can live life alone apart from God. But you and I know that that is not possible. That is a very difficult situation to be in, to be living as if, you know, you do not need a God, a Lord and Savior in your life. And so that is Jesus' call for us today, to follow him in a life of humility, as he showed us uh, by this example, entering uh, Jerusalem in a, a donkey, on a donkey. And also, as we learn today, we are also called to a life of fruitfulness. We recall from last week's sermon how Jesus cursed the fig tree on the day after his entry into Jerusalem because although it had many leaves, this fig tree did not bear fruit. When we look at the scripture, it tells us that this happened during the Passover, around the, the feast of the Passover, which is around March or April. On this particular day, Jesus was very hungry. And although it was not the season for, uh, for figs, Jesus approached the tree hoping that there would be buds on the, on the fig tree because uh, buds were considered something to be eaten. And so he was hungry and he was hoping as he approached the tree that there would be buds on the tree. But lo and behold, all he saw were the beautiful uh, leaves. No? So it seemed from the outside that this was a uh, uh, young and productive uh, tree because of the beautiful leaves. But on further, on closer look, he saw that there were no uh, buds present. This was an unfruitful tree. Even for us, as we apply this lesson about, about the fig tree, the same call is, expected, is, is made to us. We are all called to be fruitful. If we profess faith in Jesus, the same call of the fig tree is, uh, applies to us as well. We are called to be fruitful. To a large extent, until today, the nation of Israel continues to be unfruitful. And sadly, as it applies to each one of us, we look around. And sometimes, if we ask ourselves that question, am I being faithful? to the call to be fruitful. Some of us, you know, would accept that we have not been faithful in this call to fruitfulness. In one of the growth groups I attended last week, the question came up about this lesson of the fig tree. Because as we were discussing it, we said that the fig tree refers to the nation of Israel that had remained uh, stubborn, that had remained proud, and unaccepting of Jesus Christ as a uh, uh, Savior. But, you know, we, we said that historically, of course, that is true. The fig tree represents Israel. But he was also true. This person in that growth group was also accurate in saying that the way that Scripture spoke to him, it was as if uh, he was being addressed that he needed to be fruitful. So there's nothing wrong with, do, with making that assumption because that is how the word is. It was uh, a real, it was true then during Bible times, the way that uh, Jesus spoke about the fig tree referring to uh, the nation of Israel, but it is still true now for those who uh, claim to be followers of Jesus Christ and yet do not display the fruitfulness that is, that is expected of uh, the faithful. 
So the question I would like to pose is, are we bearing fruit? And equally important, what kind of fruit are we bearing? I would like to propose that there are three ways, and uh, this is a list that is by no means um, uh, exhaustive, but this is just based on my own reflection. And so three ways that I say that we can bear fruit. First, we could bear fruit about sharing the love of Jesus to those around us, especially to those who need hope amidst their trials and challenges in life. We all go through different situations in life. And uh, I would just like to share, uh, two weeks ago, uh, a friend of ours, a friend of my wife, uh, somebody she went to uh, university with, um, his name is Juni. So Juni's uh, daughter, 24 years old, he related uh, to me that uh, two weeks ago on a Thursday, I believe it was, Thursday evening, uh, he and his three children were uh, in animated conversation. They were very happy, you know, in, in uh, their room, talking. And then the following day, uh, he woke up, Juni woke up, and then when he tried to wake up, send the, the two children to wake up their ate. This is their eldest uh, daughter. And uh, when, when he went up, when the, the two other children went up to uh, wake up their ate, Lo and behold, she said, you know, I have a migraine headache. So Juni thought, you know, it's a migraine headache, so uh, give her paracetamol. But, you know, later on, when, when Juni went up again to, to see her in her bedroom, he noticed that, you know, she was uh, experiencing tremor. She was shaking. And so he knew right then that it was not a mere uh, migraine headache that his daughter had. So they brought her to the hospital, and uh, fast forward, fast forward, that was uh, uh, Friday morning. Thursday, they were talking. Uh, Friday morning, they, they had to rush her to the hospital. And the initial findings of the hospital uh, were not good. And so they had to transfer her, uh, his daughter to Makati Med. And uh, the following day, uh, Saturday, well, they, they did, they it had to do a, uh, uh, they had to do surgery on his daughter because the, the symptoms that he, she displayed were similar to someone having an aneurysm. So there was swelling on the brain and then when they did an MRI, found out that there was blood you know, in her brain. And his daughter is a young 24-year-old girl, just recently graduated from architecture and uh, had just recently passed the board exams for architecture. And so you can imagine the trauma of this uh, man. Uh, who had to go through this. But on that Saturday morning, as he was on his way to Makati Med to visit uh, his daughter, he got a call from his uh, daughter and his uh, son that uh, the doctors were already reviving uh, his daughter. And so, you know, in tears, he said, I think we have to let Ate go. And so he reached the hospital and the, the daughter was already uh, pronounced dead. And so in tears, the family gathered together. And, uh, but the, the best part about this, and in similar situations that we may, you may find yourselves in, is even when you face such a grim reality of your eldest daughter dying so young, so, you know, so bright, a, a bright future ahead of her, the saving uh, uh, knowledge is that this family is secure in their faith in God. They're Christians, they're believers, they attend another church. But even if that were the case, it was difficult for, for Juni, especially since four years ago, his wife died, uh, uh, succumbed to uh, cancer. And so the tragedy that, bef that befell this family is unthinkable. And especially, like, I, I, our eldest daughter is 25 years old. I cannot imagine, you know, losing my, uh, any of my two daughters, you know, to uh, any sickness. But... Our comfort is in knowing that if you have Jesus Christ in your life, in your heart, that you begin to understand. And in this particular uh, situation, as, as this family was in a crossroad uh, themselves, he approached me uh, after the necrological service that I was invited to, to do uh, on, on uh, the following week. 
And he approached me and said, thank you, Pastor, for the reminder that we don't hold our lives in our own hands. Our lives actually belong to God. And it is up to God, you know, because He ordains all the days of our lives from our rising up to our going down. And even if we don't understand, you know, if we are submitted to God, if we recognize God as Lord Jesus, as Lord and Savior, we have that quiet assurance that God will be with us, that He will be faithful uh, to us. He will never, indeed, He will never leave us nor forsake us. And so that is the call for us. We need to share about the love of Jesus to others. Secondly, we are called to live like Jesus. As I mentioned earlier, it's easier said than done. But by the wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, I pray that we may all indeed be able to live a life as a testimony of Jesus whom we represent in this dark and dreary world. Sometimes when you're confronted with situations such as that of our friend, and uh, people perhaps who do not have that same confidence in their heart, people who have not accepted Jesus Christ in their heart, would wonder, how are you able to do that? Paano mo overcome losing your wife four years ago and then now your eldest daughter? And so by our testimony, we are able to, to see you know, and, and to show others how, what the difference is when you have Jesus Christ in your heart. By being able to display that kind of testimony, we can be a light into this dark and dreary world. The third point that I would like to share, we can bear fruit by pointing others to Jesus, especially those who do not know Jesus yet. Jesus is the only way. There's no other way by which we may be saved. And Jesus himself said this, in John 14, 6, it's a very good reminder. And this is Jesus speaking. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What is significant here that struck me, that should strike each of us, is that th this was Jesus himself. These were Jesus' own words pointing to himself. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. How plain and simple does it get? So let us point people, let us point those who are lost to Jesus. Let us point the despondent and even those who may have already accepted Jesus Christ in their life before, but somehow because of the uh, uh, challenges that they go through, they may have uh, gotten weak no, in their faith. In Tagalog, medyo nang hina sa pananampalataya, and somehow they let go of their faith in Jesus. The same call is true for us to be able to point these people who have somehow veered away, medyo naligaw ng landas ng konte, no? that we can point these people back to Jesus Christ. Indeed, Jesus is the way. There is no other way to the Father except through Jesus. Jesus did not say, I am one of the ways to the Father. He said, I am the way. And also, I would like to give, you, uh, give this uh, to you. It came during my um, uh, reflection uh, on this uh, message. And I say here, fruitfulness is key to prove our faith in Jesus. Indeed, if we say that we are a follower of Jesus Christ, if we have faith in Jesus Christ, if we have faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, the call for us is to be fruitful as we are faithful. So let me repeat that again. Fruitfulness is key 
to prove our faith in Jesus. At this point, I'd like to call on a sister to share about how God used her. She's a new member of the church, she and her family, and yet it's amazing how God used this family you know, to be fruitful in such a short time here during their tenure here in GCF South Metro. Let's give a warm welcome to our sister Weng Lazo. She's here with her daughters, Abby and Ivy. Good morning, church. I am Rowena Lazo. Behind me are my daughters, Abby and Ivy. On behalf of my husband, Arnel Dennis, I would like to share how we came to GCF South Metro Church to serve God by leading precious souls to the Lord. It is a great privilege to deliver our testimony as a family. May God bless you as I testify of God's work in our lives to the good pleasure of His will. In September 2017, we were searching around Las Piñas for a church where we could serve God as a family. With the consent of my husband, we look for a church that has an organized worship and discipleship ministry. After visiting other churches, my husband told me to try to visit GCF South Metro. As we entered the rear parking lot, the huge signage caught our attention. It, it read, multiplying disciples and be part of a growth group. It came to our mind that this church has a good program for discipleship. So we went up here at, at the hall with ushers welcoming us with their ready smiles and they led us to our seats. We felt a warm welcome as they happily greeted us at the front door. Later, we were recognized as visitors during the service and surprisingly, many came to greet us and after the service, we were accompanied us to the visitor lodge. It felt awkward for me to be ushered because in my first church, I was the one ushering visitors. But this time, I knew how it did feel to be ushered. At the visitor's lunch, we met people who served us food, drinks, and of course, especially the Word of God. One of the servants was Attorney Grace Fisher. Attorney Grace got my number, and with his persistence, she always sent the main messages to invite me to go back and worship in GCF South Metro. After several Sundays, I inquired about how to become a member, and Attorney Grace found a way to lead us to 101 class. When my husband was here on vacation, the family completed the 101 class. My husband and I met Pastor Lito, and I remembered him praying for our family after one Sunday morning's worship service. Eventually, the church received us as a member during the Right Hand of Fellowship on November 2017. Pastor Lito introduced us to Tita Rose and Tito Zol the Ghostman and Tita Malu and Tito Ven Kwasi of ESB Groot Group. It was an answer prayer for us because my children and I were plugged into a Groot Group wherein we could grow together with other believers. Thank you, ESB Group, for welcoming us. Another answer prayer Related to our team multiplying disciple was when my daughter Ivy inv invited her classmates to our house to do their group work. I always prepare dinner for them. That's why they always feel at home and keep coming back and study at home with my daughter. I showed my generosity and being accommodating mother to them. In my bedtime, I included them in my prayer so that they would come to know the Lord. One day when they had another group work in our house, I offered to give them a Bible study before they go home. Paul, Lady, Riza, and some classmates got saved that night and we invited them to come to GCF South Metro. Paul and Lady came and met us and joined us one Sunday. After a month of attending the church, Paul and Lady voluntarily attended the 101 class. It was so surprising because I didn't tell them and force them to attend the class, and later on, they were baptized. They then invited Riza and JM, has already undergone the membership, and waiting for her baptism. JM is her, uh, busy in her karate training for competition every Sunday afternoon, but will continue to attend the church. My eldest daughter, Abby, also invited her friend, Vince, 
And now, amazingly, Vince is in attending the men's crossroad weekend. After a month, I asked Teacher Carol to look for a group group suited for my children. Teacher Carol introduced my daughters to Miko Beras as their GG leader. Later on, they named their group Soldiers Growth Group, and now Miko is my helpmate in discipling my daughter and their friends so that their faith in the Lord may continually grow. I'm glad to report that my daughters and most of their friends are now serving God here in GCF South Metro in various ministries. In behalf of my husband, Arnel Dennis, I'd like to share that he was instrumental in starting mission, mission works for OFWs in Saudi Arabia. And he discipled Filipinos and led them to church where they could grow their faith in God. Previously, during the holidays in Saudi Arabia, he traveled 400 kilometers from Riyadh to Al Kobar and Al Jubail to conduct training in piano, homiletics, and had the opportunity to preach to them in a joint fellowship of mission churches in Saudi. To end our testimony, I'd like to read 1 Corinthians 15 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as mass as you know, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. My beloved brethren, my family would like to bring back all the glory and praises to our God. Have a blessed Sunday morning to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Weng, Abby, and uh, Ivy. They're a living testimony of how they were faithful you know, in God's call to fruitfulness. That in spite of the fact that they've only been a couple of months in GCF South Metro, they've become members, they've been baptized, they uh, have invited, uh, their daughters have invited their friends who likewise have uh, become members of GCF South Metro. So it's a wonderful story that should be repeated, you know, uh, over and over again. But going back uh, to our message this morning, the last important event uh, preceding uh, in the preceding sermon that will help us understand our sermon today is about Jesus cleansing the temple of the vendors, the money changers, because they had turned the temple, in his words, you know, in, into a marketplace, a uh, den of robbers instead of a house of prayer. Uh, it is written in Mark eleven seventeen, and he was teaching them and saying to them, my house shall be a called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. So this was Jesus' anger, you know, that uh, when he found out that the temple was being used as a den of robbers, uh, so to speak. And perhaps uh, uh, for us uh, today, that question, the same question begs to be asked. What does the church, what does the house of God mean to you today? Jesus thought that his house was to be a house of prayer. And for us today, it is called to be a house of worship where we corporately come and uh, to worship the Lord, give back the glory to Him for what He is doing in our lives. And amidst this scenario, we come to today's message. And the question I would like to ask you is, what does it mean for followers of Jesus to live fruitful lives? So the answer to that in a simple uh, formula, I say is, Faithfulness equals fruitfulness. It goes hand in hand. Faithfulness, uh, fruitfulness comes hand in hand with faithfulness. You cannot be faithful if you are not fruitful. And so we look at our scripture, and the first uh, section that uh, is mentioned is about is concerning Jesus' authority, uh, found in Mark 11:27 to 33. So we find Jesus and his disciples entering Jerusalem once again. And as, as they walked into the temple, they were confronted by the religious leaders. And this was caused by the religious leaders' indignation at, at what Jesus had been doing. And what is it that he was doing? Was, uh, refers to his act of cleansing the temple. The, the leaders were so incensed. The Pharisees were so indignant. Why did Jesus drive out the, the vendors and the money changers? We recall that in the past, there were several instances already where the Pharisees were questioning what Jesus did. They were questioning why he was uh, healing on a Sabbath. 
They questioned why he was driving out demons. They questioned why Jesus and his disciples were not observing Jewish traditions. And so this was the last straw, so to speak. Kumbaga na puno na yung mga Pharisees. And that is why they confronted uh, Jesus by this question in Mark 11:28. By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? No? Sino ba? Who gave you this, the authority to drive out these vendors? You and I can um, make a guess that perhaps the leaders were so incensed na pinaalis yung mga vendors because siguro merong, meron silang share, meron silang commission no? from what the vendors were uh, earning from uh, practicing their trade in the marketplace. But whatever it was, it was a, a strong enough reason for them to confront Jesus at the temple at this particular time. That is why the urgent call for us to be fruitful for Jesus is so that those who fall into the world's trap, these leaders fell into the trap of the world. They were blinded you know, by money, by their power, by uh, their fame. And so we need to be fruitful for Jesus so those who may have fallen into this trap might be delivered and may be able to receive God's promise of hope and everlasting life through Jesus Christ. Jesus' answer to the uh, religious leaders to this question uh, came in the form of a question uh, as well. When he said, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And he demanded an answer. Jesus said, answer me. So this was uh, like a trap. There was no way that the uh, Pharisees, that the leaders could answer you know, correctly. Because if they said that Jesus, uh, that John's baptism was from heaven, the question that begs to be asked is, why then don't you believe in Jesus? If you believe that John's baptism is from heaven. But on the other hand, if they said that they believe that G, uh, John's baptism is from man, they would certainly have gotten the ire of the people because it was generally believed that John the Baptist was truly a prophet from God. So, this, so they were trapped and they just uh, uh, took the easy way out. The disciples chose to answer, we do not know, you know, the answer to his question. For many of us, we may be confronted by difficult situation and we just, like the leaders, just shake our heads in shame or disbelief or some of us would probably just scratch our head. No, we don't know the answer. But in verse 33, Jesus answered, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. With Jesus' words, the religious leader's question was, in Tagalog, nasupalpal. No? So Jesus won, religious leaders zero. To recap, Jesus' authority was questioned by the religious leaders after he cleansed the temple in Jerusalem. And as we try to apply it to ourselves in our individual contexts, we see the need to obey the call to fruitfulness so that we may be able to lead others to Christ. Before we proceed to the next uh, section, allow me to read from um, Scripture, where it is written about exactly who Jesus is that we need to be fruitful for. Let us uh, read uh, from uh, the screen, Colossians 1, 15 to 20, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. 
For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Brothers and sisters, this is who Jesus is. This is the message that we are to proclaim as we profess faith in Jesus. We are to be fruitful and we need not be ashamed because Jesus, as was written in, in these verses, is someone we know. Someone we know that can be the source of strength and encouragement to those who may have otherwise lost hope in their situations. Hallelujah. Moving on to the second section of our text concerning God's kingdom. Jesus spoke again through the parable of the vineyard to the uh, religious leaders. So in the parable, we find the owner of the vineyard preparing it for planting, preparing it for harvest. So he did, the owner did everything that he could to prepare the vineyard for harvest. And so as he went out uh, of the country, he looked for tenants who would take care of the vineyard who would till the soil and make it fruitful uh, for harvest. And at the expected uh, season of harvest, the, the owner sent a servant. You know? uh, they have what they call, well, in Bulacan, in uh, my, my mother's family used to own a small track of land there. Ang tawag nila dun sa tiller, kasama. No? Kasama. And so at the appointed time of harvest, you, know, you, you expect to get a fair share of the harvest as the owner. And that is, what Je uh, that is what Jesus did. He sent a servant to go to the tenant to ask for his share of the harvest. But what did the tenants do? They beat up the, the first servant that was sent. And so after they beat up the first servant, Jesus, the, the owner sent another servant. And this time they shamed and struck the servant on the head. And so afterwards, the owner sent a third uh, servant to come and collect his share of the harvest. And what did the tenants do? They killed the third servant. And they also killed the other servants that followed this third servant. Finally, the owner said, I will send my son, my only son. Perhaps they will treat my son uh, differently. They will respect that this is my son. But lo and behold, the son was killed likewise and thrown out of the vineyard just like the others. The son was treated no different by the insolent tenants. In this parable, we see the owner of the vineyard is God who prepared the vineyard to be planted. He built a fence around it and dug a wine press, built a tower to prepare it once the fruit was ready to be harvested. The vineyard is the kingdom, the kingdom that God was preparing, or it could be in reference to the nation of Israel, who remained stubborn. And the servants refer to the prophets, the early prophets, and today's faithful believers. These are the servants that were sent to collect the harvest. Included in the list of the prophets is John the Baptist, who was also killed and was recognized as a prophet. And the tenants are the religious leaders, and in the present day, those who continue to reject Jesus. And finally, from this parable, the Son is Jesus Christ himself. He was sent by the owner. He was worthy of respect, but was treated wrongly by the tenants. The Son, Jesus Christ, was rejected by the religious leaders who were entrusted to take care, who was instructed 
to take care of the kingdom that God had established. As we take a closer look at the parable, we cannot help but compare it to the present day, where perhaps the same continues to happen until today. Jesus Christ, God's Son, was sent to the world to save people from their sins. And this is best described for us in the most familiar uh, Bible verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So this scripture reminds us, so great is the Father's love, so great is the uh, vineyard owner's love, that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, so that we who are sinners may be forgiven of our sins, so that we may be reconciled to the love of the Father. And this relationship with the Father was broken because of our sins. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Indeed, all have sinned. I, who speak to you today, have sinned. Pastor Lito has sinned. Your elders have sinned. Everyone here has sinned. And our sins have caused us to be separated from the love of the Father. Don't you agree? When you, when you do something that you know is against uh, God, that is against His will, we have that sense of guilt. We carry that sense of guilt. And somehow, you know, we, we, we know that because of our act, we cannot go to the Father. And that is why we need Jesus. And that is aptly uh, reminded of us in uh, Romans 6.23. The first part of that verse says, For the wages of sin is death. Not a physical death, because all of us would surely die but a spiritual death, a separation, so to speak, from the Father because of our sins. But the good news is contained in the second part of Romans 6, 23. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Indeed, Jesus is the free gift given by the Father who loved the world so much that he did not want the world to continue to suffer for their sins. He made a way and gave Jesus as the free gift so that by receiving Jesus, we could be forgiven of our sins. What a glorious promise that is ours for the taking. Today, if you have not received that glorious promise, if you have somehow lived through life Yes, you know, you, you go through life, uh, but somehow you don't have that joy in your heart. There's something missing. There's something lacking in your life because you do not have Jesus, because you are like one of those tenants who have repeatedly refused to accept the servants and have accept, refused to accept Jesus that God has sent to you. If you are one of those, or if you are one of those who has already accepted Jesus Christ, and yet because of life's uh, worries and cares, you have somehow taken the wrong path. Somehow you feel like you've strayed away and uh, you find it difficult because of your sins to go back and to have that relationship that you have with Jesus. You need to have that relationship somehow restored. I invite you to... Say this prayer with me. If you fall in either of those uh, two uh, categories, please join me in this prayer and make this a, this a prayer of your heart. Father, we thank you for your word, for that message, Lord, about the parable of the vineyard. Father, indeed, for some of us, we have refused to accept the offer of God the Father because we think that we can live life on our own without Jesus beside us, right alongside us. Lord, forgive us for those times when we thought that we could, life, we could live life on our own, that we can continue 
uh, struggling through the uh, difficulties that we encounter. But yet today, the message is clear from this parable of the vineyard that we need to humble ourselves, follow the example of Jesus who humbled himself and accepted the pain and the humiliation of death on the cross so that we may be forgiven of our sins. Today, I accept Jesus Christ into my heart. And I pray that from this day, Lord, you may send people to come alongside me and help me grow in my relationship with you. Thank you for the, give, for the forgiveness of sin that you offer through Jesus Christ. And for those who may have accepted Jesus Christ before but have somehow strayed away, I pray that this indeed would be the day. Once again, Lord, we surrender our lives to you. We accept our frailness, our weakness. And thank you, Father, for that victory that we have knowing that you are the God who loves us, the God who will not withhold your only begotten Son. And may our response be different from those tenants in the parable that today we accept that gift of life through Jesus Christ. Amen. As the son, as the son was killed and thrown out of the vineyard, Jesus asked what the owner of the vineyard would do. He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. So if you reject Jesus, he will give the vineyard. He will give the opportunity to others who have yet to know him. In, in um, uh, verse 10, Jesus quoted scripture taken from Psalm 118, 22 to 23. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Indeed, Jesus is that cornerstone, that very foundation by which we all can live. But that is conditioned on us accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Jesus was rejected by the tenants, and he became the cornerstone for you and I. As we are reminded in Acts 4.12, it says, And there is no salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Brothers and sisters, only by Jesus, only by his blood, can we be forgiven of our sins. That is the message that we need to bring, to give as we obey God's call to fruitfulness. May we be faithful in being fruitful for the Lord. By his wonderful act of forgiving us for our sins, we have been saved from a life of condemnation. I would like to call on the praise team to come forward to sing a response song for us to be reminded about what God has done and that what we need to do in response to this call. Let us give back the glory to him through our lives and through living a life of faith toward faithfulness. Let us meditate on the lyrics, on the message of this song. And I pray that this would not just be empty words, but rather words that will move you to action. Let us listen and sing this song. God of justice, Savior to all, came to rescue the weak and the poor, chose to serve and not be served. Jesus, you have called us freely. Stand by. 
this side the broken we must go stepping forward keep us from just singing move us into action we must go church can i invite you all to stand up as we sing this together Father, indeed, the, the call is clear for us. We must go. We must go. To proclaim the love of Jesus, the love of the Father. Lord, allow us to step out of our comfort zone and reach out and be a messenger of good news so that we may be faithful to this call to become fruitful for Jesus. Indeed, Lord, there is no name by which people may be, might be saved but through Jesus Christ. I pray for each one of us, Lord, that we may be faithful to this call, that we may be fruitful in that in the way that we leave others to Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here uh, today. I pray that the Lord, that the Word has uh, spoken to their hearts, that indeed their desire is to be faithful in proclaiming your Word, in being fruitful for the kingdom. And now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.
church, before we leave this place, let's sing this last song together as one body in Christ. Let's lift up our voices. God of ages, bringing glory here. You are good, you are good. Salvation to us, offer your peace. 